Leadership, purpose, service. This is Fulfilling the Dream with Wayman Brett. Your path to greatness is not simply paved with the grinding feet of persistence. Through motivating stories and personal testimonials, gain the insight you need to overcome life's biggest challenges and break through those barriers that hinder you. So when opportunity knocks at your door, you'll be ready. Welcome to Fulfilling the Dream. Hello, I'm Wayman Britt, and welcome to Fulfilling the Dream. I'm with Paul Collins, Paul Lamar Collins, and he is one of the greatest realist artists of our time. And he has devoted his life to promoting beauty of diversity, embracing humanity, and inspiring a brighter future in all. Paul's dominance as an artist and a realist painter grew out of his diligent study, his experimentation, and his determination. And we're so happy to have Paul with us today. Welcome, Paul Collins. Thank you for the introduction. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I am so happy you're here. You know, Paul, I've been researching you, been looking through all of the uh, historical information about your life, and man, I am so grateful to have you in the studio today. It's really hard. When I look at some of that stuff, it's hard for me to even believe it. I know. You it's, know? it's amazing. Look, look at the stuff that you've done, the yeah. people that you've met. Unbelievable, it's, it's Paul. Incredible. Unbelievable. And I, I'm, I'm so grateful that we get an opportunity to ask you a few questions about your, your journey and so forth. One of the things I want you to tell us about is how you were inspired to move into this artistry, the ability to paint like you do, the, the realism that you, you put on the canvas. How did that start? What, what prompted that? That's a good question. And it has so much to do with the kind of social background we have and how you treat it and how you see other people treat it. And your family, which was my mother and my two sisters, it didn't start out very good, though. My first father, I call him the sperm donor. Uh -huh. He was an alcoholic. Wow. God bless his soul. Yeah. And he didn't, he wasn't very good with my mother or us kids because of that. And we were living in Muskegon then. And mom's father, Mr. Hall, well, heard about that and came and got us out of Muskegon, brought us to Grand Rapids. And we lived with him mm -hmm. for quite a while. And the things that you are today our testimony, the things that happened to you along the way when you were young. Mm. That's why it's so important for us to remember the kids, what kind of environment they're in. Mm -hmm. What kind of things are they learning? Are they in a positive environment about themselves and about other people? Mm. And as I grew up, I realized, because I was in a bad environment for a while, mm -hmm. and uh, the thing that we had was girls are nothing but pretty and, and get their vagina, and you were really cool if you <laughs> could count the number of women that's that right. you got. I'm absolutely serious. I know. You had no respect, and that's all the respect. I, you don't even call that respect. And I was picking that up from the street. Yeah. And as time went on, I'm in high school now, and I thought I was going to be pretty good in sports because I was pretty good. I was a quarterback. Mm -hmm. You're about, what, 6'1"? Yeah. 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 And uh, one of the things that began to happen for the first time because my father – was a new man that my mother had met, Prince Mitchell. Mm -hmm. And he worked at uh, Rowe Hotel. And he seems to be the kind of symbol that you need to be as a father 
for your kids. He was a very positive man. Right. And he worked hard. And I could tell he loved mom, <laughs> which was really important. Yes. And he had a lot of respect for her. And mm -hmm. we learned a lot from him, but he didn't stay around too long. But one of the things that happened when uh, mom met him, uh, they got married and uh, then they moved to 537 James. Mm. And he got a real good job at the Morton Hotel then. And he met a man by the name of a doctor. And this doctor had uh, a second home, one of them out in Ada, Dr. Clinton Fauché. Mm -hmm. And he offered PC the job of coming out there and running it because he couldn't be out there all the time. Right. And he had a horse called Whirlaway. Hmm. And we all went out there. And that's when I first felt racism. Because mm. us kids, first of all, we had to walk about three miles in Ada to go to school. Sure. And uh, we were the only kids of color in that school. Yeah. And sometimes they would follow us home telling us, go back to Africa. Mm. And something came out of me then that I had never experienced before, a violence. And one time when they were coming, chasing us home, telling us, go back to Africa, I got a big club and beat the shit out of one of the guys. Wow. And I was kind of sorry I did it, and then I wasn't sorry. <laughs> but one of the things that happened also, there was a grocery store not too far from school in Ada. Mm -hmm. And a guy by the name of Dick DeVries owned it. Mm -hmm. And he came out there. And he got all three of us and come and put us in his store. And he said, I'm going to call your dad to come and get you. And in the meantime, we need to go talk to the principal of that school. Wow. Mm. And uh, I was really impressed with him for doing that. And he stayed in my mind for quite a while. I learned a lot by living on farm. In fact, I <laughs> one of my responsibilities was milking the cows and getting them to pasture and taking them out to pasture. Mm -hmm. And I was doing something that a lot of farmers said <laughs> wasn't a good idea. Because I always said that, why are you, I said, why are we feeding these cows the same damn thing every day? <laughs> And Pete says, well, what do you have in mind? I said, why don't we start giving them some fruit, you know? And I did. And uh, when I went out to get them, they saw me come and they would run to me. <laughs> <laughs> and the farmers told my dad, your son is sporting those cows. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was a nice time we had on the farm, but uh, that – racist thing in that school kind of stuck with yeah. me. And PC didn't stay there too long. We left the farm and he went back in town and worked at the Pantland Hotel. And uh, all of a sudden he was doing really good financially. And we decided to buy a house over on Logan Street. Yeah. And my mother who has Irish blood, Native American blood, and a touch of African blood. She was really light-skinned. Yeah. So the people who were negotiating about that house on Logan we were first talking to my mom. They hadn't met PC yet. And they were all set to make a deal, and PC appeared, hmm. and they said, oh, I'm sorry, we don't sell the colored people. Hmm. Hmm. And, and, and that, was, that was a heartbreaker. And uh, PC almost, my mom and him grabbed each other. And they said, are you kidding? Why does the color got anything to do with this? Mm -hmm. Please, we're not selling to you. Uh, we can forget the deal. So uh, the man who owned um, a hardware store over on Wealthy Street, mm -hmm. uh, see, I forget his name.
What does that say? Heisinger. Heisinger, yeah. Mr. Heisinger. He heard about it because he and PC knew each other. And he said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard in my life. He bought the house ah. and then sold it back to PC. <laughs> there you go. But one thing stays in my mind. You shouldn't stereotype all people. Yes. Because there's not really one group of people where they're all the same. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, he proved that uh, that is a truth. Be careful about how you stigmatize people. Cast everybody in one box. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. But anyway, we're going to Ottawa Hills High School now. And it's, it's quite a long walk from where we lived at 709 Logan over to Ottawa. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that kept appearing, I wanted to play football, and I was playing football and basketball, but I also was doing a lot of little drawing on my papers, and some of the kids in the class wanted me to draw things on theirs too. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Lally one day told me, she said, I'm going to let you start drawing the the assignments on the board. Hmm. I said, why? She said, you don't know it, but you got a really exceptional talent that you could really go around the world with. And I thought she was crazy. All I could think about, I want to be a, a bad quarterback. Sure. And as time went on, it kept going. And all of a sudden I realized maybe she had something. You know, maybe there is something to that. Yeah. So when I graduated from Ottawa, I went to Kendall School of Design, thinking that uh, this is a good way to bring out, if it's true, what she has said about me. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened to me at Kendall. Huh. I actually could draw and do better than the teacher. And the kids realized that, and the kids would come over and start asking me to help them with their work. So he didn't like that. And one day we have, um, every day we would go over articles in the paper. Mm -hmm. And there was an article in the paper about this young black kid in Mississippi who whistled at a white girl. And the next day they found him floating down the river. Mm -hmm. Emmett Till, remember? I remember. Yes, yes, yes. So it was really interesting because we wanted to talk about it. And this is when all of a sudden my life started changing when it mm -hmm. comes to that whole race thing. Mm -hmm. And I said, how could you possibly say? He said, well, he should have known better than that. I got up and slapped the shit out of him. You did? Yeah. And I wow. said, no, that's a terrible thing for you to say. It's a terrible thing for you to say for all of us that it was okay yes. uh, for you uh, to kill this kid what? because he whistled at the white girl. Right. What, what happened to you when you did that? What? Uh, well, what happened is he kicked me out of school. And Walter oh, Cole was chief of police then. Oh, yes. He heard about the story. He grabbed my hand. He said, come on, we're going back to school. And boy, he got all over Mr. Abenshine and told him, no, oh, he stays in school. You're not kicking this boy out because he was telling the truth. And how dare you make these kids think it was all right to kill this young boy just because he whistled at a white girl. Yes, yes, yes. And I said, you know what? I don't want to be in this school anymore. To hell with Kendall School of Design. Huh. Yeah. And so I... When I got out of there, uh, I met Randy Brown because we had an, uh, lived on, over his house. He had an upstairs over his house, and we had lived there for a while. And Randy was an hell of an artist and a poet and a writer. Wow. And uh, he saw what I was doing. And, and at the time, he was doing specs for the telephone company. And that's when you'd go to somebody who has a business and and uh, they wanted to be in the yellow pages back then and you do a sketch of how it looked back there. Right. And that's what Randy and I were doing. 
And then I went on for a while, and Randy kept telling me, man, I wish I could do that the way you're doing it. And uh, he started letting me do almost all the specs. Wow. And so one thing led to another. And then Randy and I decided to do something incredible. We decided to start a business of sign painting. Huh. And we called it Ranco. And that's something that's that, a cool name. Yeah, and that's something that never happened in our community to have two black boys painting signs. How much older was Randy than you at the time? Oh, Randy was probably probably seven or eight years. Okay. Seven or eight years older than me. Okay. And I'll give you an example. Mr. Moverhill was coming out with his brand new car. And at that time, we were beginning to really to get our the name. Mulva, Mulva Hill was the owner of the Mobile Hill. Mobile Hill Oldsmobile. Okay, the, 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 the dealership. Right. Okay. And they're coming out with a new car. So uh, Randy and I decided to go see if we could uh, put it on his window when people could come and see the car. Mm -hmm. And he looked at me and said, color boys don't know how to do that work. <laughs> So we had another friend, Jerry Subar, who was Jewish, who had let us do a lot of his work. And I told him the story. He said, he said, you go back and tell Mr. Moverhill that you would do that. And he doesn't have to pay if he doesn't like it. I said, yeah, okay, we'll do that. Hmm. And so we went back and told Mr. Moverhill that. We said, look, uh, we'll make a deal with you. We'll letter your windows. And if you don't like what we've done, you don't have to pay us. Now, not only did we letter his windows, I painted a big picture of him on the window. Oh. He went and grabbed my hand and grabbed Randy's hand and said, will you go to church with me tomorrow? I said, for what? For me being so damn stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. And as time went on, everybody in business wanted me and Randy to do some of their work. Awesome. And uh, so we decided one day to go out to Amway yeah, and uh, talk to Rich. And they were wide open. And they didn't have anything about, well, you, got, you guys are color boys, black boys, you can't do that work. Yeah. Rich said, yeah, can you do that? I said, yeah. yeah. He said, go to it. And we designed their first logo. Wow. Wonderful. Oh, and, wow. And in the process of doing that, listen to this, Randy and I went and... Uh, to a little restaurant that was out there. And the guys in the restaurant said, uh, are you doing work for uh, um, the boss and, and Ben Andel? They got some weird ideas. They might not name, name even pay you. Wow. And uh, so I went and, and uh, after we were finished, I told Richard about it. He said, Get, he said, guess what they told me about you and Randy? You know, colored boys can't do that work. <laughs> he tells you that. And you're actually going to let them do, try to do that for you? So, again, it shows you the difference between stereotyping. Yes. You no? Know? Yes. You can't put everybody in the same box. No, you Not really can't. Just because they're the same color of the skin or they yeah. speak the same language. It's amazing what we do. Yeah. And we and then we, we, we set ourselves up for missed opportunities is what happens. So, Paul... Talk to us about your your journey to Africa, West Africa, and, and what prompted that. I, I remember you were telling me about some of the things that you were seeing in the depiction of African uh, Americans, I think. That's well, my, the whole idea was all of a sudden I had begun to really put a lot of my negative stuff that I was thinking being in the street and with the gang and with the boys. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I realized that Randy and I were doing something really important. Then it also occurred to me, all the things that we hear, we hear from sources who are kind of negative, especially mm -hmm. about Africa. And I said, you know, I, I really would like to go there and find out myself what's going on mm -hmm. and produce a book and paintings and show some of the true facts that are really going mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. And when I went there, I took my uh, son Michael with me, and Tom Lee was the writer. And back then, 
Guy Vanderjack and and President Ford, who wasn't president then, he was a congressman, mm -hmm. and Hal Sorry, they all supported me. And when I Wonderful. went to Senegal, they all knew about me because they had told them about me. Sure. Wow. And the American embassy wanted to uh, get involved with me, too, while I was there. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I really, really found out and really torched me, it really hurt me, that there was a place called uh, Gory Island where we were under the impression the English people, when they went over there, they got their slaves with guns. Mm. Not true. They were selling their brothers. They would take different tribes and have their brothers and put them in this yeah. huge old beat up building, chain them against the wall and let them come in and buy them. And that really, 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 really broke my heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, Pat's Enzyme, who was with the uh, children, Save the Children organization. Mm -hmm. He's the one who took me there. And uh, there were so many things that I, that I found out that I really, really hurt, hurt me bad. Hmm. And so we, 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 I decided that uh, I had to find ways that I could really help out. And there's an organization called Doctors Without Borders. I think I've heard of them. They're yes. doing a hell of a yes. job. Yes. Oh, they really are. I admire them so yeah. much. Yeah. And I got an up vow with uh, uh, Save the Children and some of the money that I was making. Uh, I invested in food, for getting food for the kids. Because so, some of them kids, if they got one meal a day, they were lucky, mm -hmm. you know. Mm. And uh, it, it just it just really hurt me, some of the things that were going on there. And their hospitals there, dirt floors, mm -hmm. and everybody comes into one room. And that, that again, mm. we don't realize. We're so spoiled here. We don't realize how sure. lucky we are. We don't. We really don't. We don't. I agree. And uh, all those things were things begin to really get inside of me mm -hmm. and things I wanted to do something about. And uh, I had decided to take a little breather, and I took Michael uh, and I, and we went, we went back, and I come back on my, all by myself. This is your son, Michael. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I did was I found some of the French people who owned uh, a shop, mm -hmm. and I said, uh, because... They had all these restaurants, and so many kids would go into the restaurants begging for money or for food. Mm -hmm. And the army and the, and the uh, police would beat them. And that bothered me. That just bothered me. And I, and I had an idea, and uh, I got together with a, the hardware store, a Frenchman who owned the hardware store, mm -hmm. and uh, he helped me because I got some money to do this when I came back. Mm -hmm. Start building little boxes uh, so they could shine shoes. So I I, we, we built, thanks to this uh, Frenchman, we built probably about 20 or 30 of those little boxes and gave them to the kids. Mm -hmm. And uh, the soldiers and the police were no longer embarrassed because the kids were, weren't begging. They were saying, we'll shine your shoes yes. and make some money. Yes, yes, that was great, Paul. And Man. then, uh, and, and it worked really well. Right. And what was really interesting, as I was leaving, so many of these kids who I got these boxes made up for lined up along the uh, airline. Right. And all of them shined my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I had my shoes. shoes shined about a hundred <laughs> times. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Paul, you 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 told me also about uh, Mother Teresa, and and you met her, uh, and and I think you've drawn you've drawn paintings of her. Could you tell us about Mother Teresa? When I was living in Israel, I was uh, a friend. I had a friend of Father Godfrey, who was really open minded and really enjoyed talking with me. 
and he used to tell all the people, if you're going to talk to Paul, you got to be prepared. He's got a lot of questions. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and he was right. But anyway, um, I also did a portrait of him for his church. And uh, I found out that he was dying. And before he died, he gave me a letter to give Mother Teresa. And everybody said, well, what was in the letter? I said, you really think I would open up a personal letter he oh, gave to her? Right. Hell, I don't know what was in the damn you letter. I that. wouldn't do that. No. So I gave her the letter, and uh, it was just incredible. All the kids that those nuns were taking care of, kids that were found in trucks that were being sold, and the nuns are taking care of them so well. Wow. And I, I hugged her because I had, I had, I had find it was time for me to go. And she said, Paul, there's somebody I want you to meet. Hmm. And she, I said, who do you want me to meet? She said, Jerry Falwell. I said, sister, I don't want to meet Jerry Falwell. She said, as a favor for me. I said, okay. So there's Jerry Falwell out there with all his cameras and everything. Sure. And she introduced him to him, and the first thing he says, Paul Collins, have you found Jesus? <laughs> and guess what I said to him? What did you say? I beg your pardon, I didn't know he was lost. <laughs> the nuns just all cracked up, man. I they just, they, up they, too. Oh, they oh did. Oh, my gosh. And I, How did he respond to that? I bet he was. Oh, he, he was, was so embarrassed, like, he yeah. didn't know what to do. He said, I, I, I don't know, know how to deal with that. I don't know how to deal with that. I said, that's uh, good. Well, next time, think about saying something that's stupid good. like that. That's so. That's crazy. So, Paul, you've designed many medals and emblems, and one of those, I believe, has to do with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Tell us about that one, if you would, please. Well, I... Uh, got on the Coretta King after he had died. Uh, I had been a supporter and helping to raise money uh, for the church. And Harry Belafonte and I got to be real good friends because he was doing the, the same thing. Sure. And uh, one day after he had gotten shot and by the way, Helen, Harry Belafonte is gone, too. Yeah, he died this past year. Yeah. A little while ago. Uh, she actually came to Grand Rapids. Coretta? Yeah, mm -hmm. and wanted me to design that medal. Mm. And uh, she said, I'll never forget the support you gave us and how you made it possible for my husband, you and so many others, to do the things he did. That's awesome. And that's why... It was so important for me to do paintings of these people who gave so much hmm. to make things possible for us today. And that's why we have to really think about that. And some of these... Uh, we stand uh, on their shoulders, don't we? Some of these uh, jive-ass gangs uh, with their pants hanging down, dropping out of school. I said, do you know how many people laid it on their lives so you could have a better mm. life? Do you know that you have to be get out there and and make also a better life for your mm. children, you know? And uh, that's, that's the message we need to share. Paul. Yeah. And uh, when I was, uh, they had me talk once at uh, the church. And after she had put me on the board, they wanted me to talk to church. And I said, look, I'm going to be very honest with you. Everybody's saying now, Black Lives Matter. But God damn it, they got to matter to you. Mm. You got to quit shooting your own self. Mm. You got to start taking mm. pride mm. and showing your kids a new road. That's right. Get your butts back in school and got your pants hanging down. Pull your pants up. I said, is that, the, is that, is that your message? That you want to go with your no. pants hanging down and shoot your own? You got to change that. Absolutely, Paul. and you should have heard the women get up and clap. Yeah, I bet they did. Oh yeah, they sure did. They know that's real. Yeah, that's real, and that's yeah. what that's what that's what's unfortunate. We don't hear that enough. I mean, I heard it growing up. There's no way that I would have been able to get away with any of that growing up with my family, my father, my mom, 
the aunts and uncles that we lived around. That's the same thing with me. Yeah. My my two daughters. Uh, I remember the one guy came up. Uh, he didn't come up. He was in the car and blew his horn. And she's. I said, "Don't you go out there. You let him have enough respect to get his That's butt right. out of there and That's knock right. on the door." That's right, Paul. That's so right. then he gets out. That's right. To do it, and guess what? He got his pants hanging down. I said, "And pull your pants up." That's right. I don't want you coming to my That's house right. with my mother and my two right. daughters with your pants hanging down. That's right. I said, what is your problem? Thank you for standing up, Paul. That's, <coughs> what we need to, that's what we need more of today. So, Paul, you have an enduring relationship with the Sioux Indian <coughs> tribe, the American Indian tribe, Sioux. And, um, and I understand they've named you. Bright Eagle. Bright Eagle. Tell us about that. How did you get the name Bright Eagle? What, what's behind it, that? It was a role that I that I played helping the Indians establish the rights to their land and also to start getting them to start eating properly. Yeah. And then I got involved with AIM, mm -hmm. the American Movement, with Dennis Banks, who was oh, yeah. the, one of the leaders. And the person who really kept me organized and kept him organized was my wife, Carol. Hmm. Carol played a big role in my life with the Native Americans because it was not easy. Carol is awesome, isn't she? Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you who else helped me, too. Uh, Guy Vanderjack and, and Ford both were, helped me when it was instrumental in keeping them from... There, there was a place called Wounded Knee. Mm -hmm. And a long time ago... 225 women, women, and children were all shot and put in a mass grave. And they were thinking about uh, having a pipeline go somewhere in there. Mm. And the Indians were protesting that, and Carol and I were part of that. And I talked to uh, uh, Gerald Ford about it, and he got back with me and said, it's not going to happen. I got a lot of support from uh, Outstanding. Washington. Outstanding. I really did. Outstanding. But some of those stories, and they have a boarding school right up here at Mount Pleasant mm -hmm. where they would actually take the kids away from the parents and force them to speak English. Yes, I remember reading about that. And they abused yeah. the girls. That's right. And uh, that's one of the things that we, we did too. We went... The ceremonies they had at Mount Pleasant, mm -hmm. Carol and I were always there. And I'll tell you another thing we did, too. Mm -hmm. And this was something that was really hard. There's so many institutions that had Indians mm -hmm. that were dead that they were using in their archives. Oh, yeah. And we wanted to get them back and give them a proper grave. And we did that, and we were pretty successful at it. And we went from Mount Pleasant where the school was and we marched and took the bodies back to the graveyards and planted them. Right. It, it was incredible though. Oh, beautiful. You, you've known uh, some amazing people, you know, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa. Yeah. Um, and Gerald Ford, you know, our 38th president, I think it was the 38th. And you got to know him well and then you painted... A mural. A huge mural here that's at the Kent County Airport. Wow. How did, how did you come across the idea, the concept of that painting? I mean, because it has more than just jury. It has a, a whole different feel to it. What was, it had what his was whole life in there. Yeah. His life from uh, the time he started to the time that uh, it was just, I really had a lot of respect for him. And one of the things that's going on right now <coughs> is that he uh, pardoned Nixon. Yes. And I talked to him for a long time about that, and he said, Paul, let me tell you the truth. I have so much I've got to do, and if I don't pardon him, I'm going to be involved in all oh, this is going to go on and on and on. Mm. He said mm. he had to get out of being president Mm. I think that was a big punishment for him. Mm -hmm. He was a hell of a man, and and uh, this character stood tall. I remember 
the story about Willis Ward at the University of Michigan, the only African American on that team, and they were not going to allow him play against a team from, uh, I think it was from Alabama, Georgia, Georgia Tech. That's what it was. And Gerald Ford, he said he wasn't going to play if if, if Willis that, Ward wasn't. That's right. Play, that's right. Right. That's right. And so so he he was very principal. And, and, and not only was he principal, also he was. He he was really good for the neighborhoods. He he made a lot of things possible. Yes, he did. Uh, and that's why again you can't say, "Well, I don't like him because he's Republican." You got to judge him by what he did. What he does. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I was really, really incredible. And you know, people in Grand Rapids don't realize how fortunate we are. Uh, so many of the people here who gotten wealthy. Don't bury their money in the Cayman Islands. They bury their money in their community. And uh, getting back to that, one of the things that my win, my name had really gotten into mm -hmm. Rich DeVos and them had spread, begin to spread my name. Mm -hmm. And Peter Cook, uh, Fred Meyer. Mm. And all of them began to let Randy and I do working for him. And so one of the things I told uh, told him was, you got to start hiring black people, not because they're black. Yeah. Because you find somebody who's qualified. That's exactly and black, right. Hire them. That's right. No matter what color and skin. Exactly. Right. And Absolutely. that's what they start doing. In fact, Amway. Agree was so concerned about my opinion and how people were listening to me. Mm -hmm. They let Randy and I have our studio at Amway for free. Or for over I remember. I, how many years was that? Over 15 or 16 years. Oh, wow. That, I remember. You had a beautiful studio down there. Yeah. And I'll tell you what happened. I'll, I'll tell you some things that happened. Back then, there was what they call the Ministerial Alliance. Yes, yes. And I told Rich and Peter Cook and Fred Meyer and all of them, I said, the people who really have the power in the communities are the preachers. You guys got to get together and sit down at a table and start talking that's how we right. get rid of the slums. And sure enough, that's what we started doing, Reverend Abbey's church. Uh, Bethel we were, Pentecostal. Yeah, that's where we start talking about getting rid of the slums. Now today... There's no slums. There's no really. If you compare us to what, what other you, cities, or what absolutely. we used to have. Yes, yes, yes. You're absolutely right. And we know you're talking about Campbell Commons, Creston Plaza, and I had uh, some of the people from uh, uh, the Black Panthers say they were coming to Grand Rapids uh -huh. uh, to protest. I said, "We don't need you here." I said, "What you need to do is go to Chicago." and find out how you can solve some of their problems. We're gotten together with a lot of people, right? white folks and black folks are sitting down and talking and making things happen. Yeah, that's right. I said, and that's what I love about Grand Rapids. Just like when you went in Amway, the first person you saw if you had an appointment with Richard J was a white, was, was right. a black woman. Right. Well, you <laughs> know what, Paul? This, this, this behavior that you're talking about uh, transcends race. I, I think some people believe that if you got money, if you have money, if you have wealth, then that makes you, you know, a racist or it makes you uh, not care about uh, their fellow man. But not everybody's made that way. See, that's why you can't make judgments like that. Yeah. You can't say this person yeah. because he's like that. All the rest of them are like right. that. But there are some that we need to challenge and that we need to deal with because the absence of leadership causes evil to continue to spread and morph into some ugly things. And we've seen that happen in history. And so people like you or people like myself who do have those relationships, who have the ability to help make our communities better, we need to speak up. And, and, and I think... God for you, the fact that you've you don't you don't mince words. You, you you do speak up and you do challenge, no matter whether white or black. And that's what we need more of. We need that leadership. And 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 I'm I'm so grateful that you've been able to to stand in the gap all these years and to and to push back when you need to push back. Yeah. Yeah. 
and to love when you need to love, right? Yeah, that's that's really true, and that uh, that 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 to me is one of the things that uh, when people tell me how successful I am with the artwork and everything, the thing that I feel most great about and inside about mm -hmm. some of the things, the changes I made right here in Grand Rapids. Like for instance, I was telling them, we sitting down with Rich and Jay and Fred Meyer and them. I said, one of the worst things we got is we got too many kids off the, in the street. We got to think of when we get the kids off the street mm -hmm. and give them something positive. Sure. Seedman Center. That's what, that's what spawned that. Yeah. Style Center. And all those were in places where kids were off the street and could do and come up with a better life. Positive, productive things. Because yeah. kids are kids have a lot of energy. Kids are going to be boys and they're going to be girls. Yeah. you you got to channel that energy yeah, in some right. way. Not everybody can play on the basketball court that's like right. you did, right? Yeah, that's right. You were pretty good. Yeah. Both football and basketball, yeah. but you chose art. Not everybody's got those talents, and you've got to find a way to give these kids something to do that's positive so that they can release that energy. So it's and, great and, to hear. And the other thing I did, too, was I said, uh, what, you know, I had other people in my corner who really understood and thought I had a great idea. I want policemen mm -hmm. to be involved. Because I don't want these kids to think the policemen are their enemies. It's the same thing with a police force. If you get one policeman who does something stupid, all the rest of them are bad. Not everybody's like that. And when you think of what these guys risk their lives every damn day. They do. Us. That, that's a lot of stress, a lot of pressure, yeah. a lot of expectation, that's responsibility. Right. It's placed on them, Paul. We all uh, ought to give the police force a break. Oh, yeah, I totally agree with that. And I'll tell you, Haggerty was a great chief of police. Uh, he used to uh, sit down with me and talk the same way you and I are talking, mm -hmm. how we can make a better community, mm -hmm. how we can get more respect and let people know Absolutely. that we're on your side. We're there for you. And when they found out I was going to, to um, take my trip, mm -hmm. To, uh, Israel? Israel. Mm -hmm. They had a big party for me at the hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, some very important people came. It, it was packed. Rosa Parks came. Rosa Parks came? Yeah, she was wow. there. Uh, the girl, Sally Ride. Uh, who we did, I did a painting of the first woman to go in space. Wow. Credit King was there. But anyway, they got a call and said, We're going to get that son of a bitch. We're going to blow his head off. So the word. They said that about you? Yeah. Somebody called in on the telephone and said they were going to blow my head off. And so the police wouldn't let me go anywhere by myself. Why would they say that? What was what was prompting that? They didn't that? like the fact I was going to Israel. They hated Jews. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Man, oh man. Where does that hate come from? That's the thing that I was trying. One of the reasons why I do what I do, I'm trying to let people know that hate does nothing but destroy all of us. That's right. And we have an opportunity to make a difference. And it's not too late. I mean, I said, and I asked people this, how in the hell do you see somebody and you look at this and they're not the same color and you say, I don't like them. Why do you do that? What is it you don't like? You, you who are a Christian believe that we all have been created by the same creator? That's right. Did God make a mistake? He did not. He did not. No, he didn't. And you know what, Paul? Only 1%, I, I read something recently, only 1% of our skin color is a part of our DNA. And out, out of all of our DNA, what makes us a person, only one, less than 1% is, is, is the tone of our skin, makes up the tone of our skin. So all the rest, all the rest, Paul, we're pretty much the same. The pigmentation is it's only 1% of our DNA. Yeah. It's amazing. But yet we make that the big deal. It's amazing, Paul. 
<laughs> just like right now, you know, it's a, it's a shame. It, it just goes on. And I don't know. And, and these people pretend to be Christians. Yeah, I know. I said, you're making the so, creator look so, like a dope. Yeah. So, Paul, question, million-dollar question. How do we create an environment for all to fulfill their dreams? No matter race, no matter color of your skin, what do we got to do? To I'll, I'll tell you one thing we got to do. We really have to start deciding on people that you send to Washington. The most important thing, not how much money they got or how people make people follow them, character. Mm. We've got to give these people in Washington character because the democracy we have is very unique and we could easily lose it and maybe never get it back again. And we don't realize how lucky we are because this is the government of the people, by the people, and for, for the, the people. people. And it's time we start acting like that. For all the people. For all the people. And, Amen. And we don't realize how lucky we are to, can, to have the kind of government we have. Mm. I mean, here we have a government mm. that, uh, and, and, and think about this for a minute. Mm -hmm. We have one of the richest countries in the world but we still have a lot of children who are going hungry. That's a fact. Why? And, and, and we have programs to try to help them, and then certain parties that want to get rid of the programs. And, and then we have people who... They want to throw the baby out with the bath. Water. Yeah. Rather than figuring out why, why is it that some are getting the food and why some aren't. And I'll tell you another thing, too. It doesn't mean the program is bad. That Amway and all of them agreed with me on. We've got to start giving work working people much more credit. Absolutely. Because without them, you never could have gotten rich. That's a fact. <laughs> that, that's a fact. That's a fact. And to think that they were considering taking away Social Security, why would you do that? Oh, my goodness. You got billions of dollars. Why, why, don't, why don't you want to give these people? Absolutely. And figure out how to be smarter, yeah. wiser, and how we use the cash that we do have. That's what we need to do, Paul. I, I did right? a series of paintings. Oh, my gosh. On uh, working people. First time they've ever been celebrated. Went to, went to the Department of Labor in Washington with them, and we had a stand-up crowd. I said, these are people you got to start saying thank you to. Yes. I said, without those people, you wouldn't be rich. No, you wouldn't. You wouldn't. And, and I said, well, and why is it that we look down on working people who go to work every freaking day? Because that's what we're taught. The culture that we're in, Paul, what's betrayed? I, I know it. I know having it. the wealth, having the rich, having the, you know, you're better than the next guy. If I have a better car, if I better have a better house, or and who's better that? clothes, who, there was that's the, what happens, Paul, yeah. in our world. Uh, who was the, the one, of, one of the richest billionaires said he didn't understand why his secretary was paying more for her, her, her taxes than he was. And he's worth billions. Was that, was that Buffett? Warren yeah, Buffett. Buffett. Yeah, yeah, Warren Buffett. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I know. He's a smart guy. I like Buffett. So, so Paul, we're, we're, we're nearing, this has been a wonderful conversation, but I got to ask you some other personal questions, just a couple of more. <laughs> I, I, I didn't think you were through. <laughs> so, so you know, we talked about your mentor, uh, Paul. Uh, we talked about Randy Brown and what a great guy he was. Were there any other mentors, people that you learned from, and what were the biggest lessons that you've learned from your mentors, including, oh, including Randy? You know, uh, Dennis Banks, who was the one of the leaders of AIM, uh, was one of my mentors too. And I'll tell you something else too that I that I learned. And this is something all men should really learn. Uh -huh. Looking at a woman and all you see is a pretty face and a vagina. Yes. It's time you realize that there's something really powerful in a woman. And I have a woman now today that uh, hmm. I don't know how she does it. She managed my life and managed Dennis Banks' life. And I just think about the time that a uh, long hmm. time ago, I never, ever dreamed a woman could do that. Mm. But all of a sudden, it occurred to me, think about your mother. 
Mom started a dry cleaners over on Granville. And my two sisters were both teachers. Uh-huh. And uh, they were great role models for me. And all of a sudden, I realized men are really stupid <laughs> when it comes to what they think a woman what is. What they value. Yeah. Yes, I agree. They're, they're, not, they're not just, uh, you know, a thing. They are a person that should be valued and cherished. I agree with you wholeheartedly. But, you know, again, we get taught that, you know, the people that we're around and the messages that we see. So you speaking up about this, Paul, and me speaking up for, for women in the world and treating our women better, my wife, Dinah, and uh, my children. And uh, that's how we get the world to change the way that we look. It's, it's our example. Paul, you've you've been to Bosnia. You, the International Peace Center reached out to you and asked you to go to Bosnia years ago. And what an amazing trip and story that was. Well, Can really you talk blew, to us about It really blew my mind. And the reason it blew my mind is because all of a sudden I realized that what I was doing is really effective. That was the most important thing. Yeah. Because some of the museums... Uh, no, no, I don't want to. I don't want to do that. Uh, you know, that's not art. Uh, and they were deciding on what art was and what art is. And I said, "There's no such thing. Art is a lot of different things. Whenever you try to stereotype art, you need to be kicked out of whatever institution you're in because art can be a lot of different things." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But. Uh, I had thought so often, because some of the uh, people upstairs had told me, you got great talent, man. Why are you messing around with that? Why don't you do some surreal stuff, some Mm -hmm. realistic stuff? Mm -hmm. And I almost listened to them. I did a couple things, and all of a sudden I said, shit, I don't, this ain't doing nothing for me. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, I'm getting nothing out of this. I'm going to do something that's going to affect people and make right. people realize that they're important and who they really are. And so I stuck to it. And when they called me to go to all the way over to Bosnia, I said I was right. I was on track. I'm glad I stayed there because mm. that's what I really want to do. I really want to have an effect on people. And going there and watching them, around my paintings Mm -hmm. and the way that they were feeling and asking questions uh, was worth all the money in the world. Mm -hmm. And you don't know what it did for me. It it just made me realize I was on the, I was a train on the right track going in the right direction. Wow. Ooh, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I also asked them, I said, what is it? about making these people go to war to begin with. And she said, well, Paul, I think I had a lot to do with the Christianity versus Muslims. A lot of them had different answers why, but nobody really was Mm -hmm. solidified in why they do what they do, Mm -hmm. why men decide to go to killing each other. Mm -hmm. But... It, it was a good. It was it was a great example for me to continue what I was doing and continue to be who I am, and making me really respect who I am. Mm, powerful. Yeah, and, and also you get. It also made me begin to realize that uh, I have children, and I want those kids to look at me and learn respect and learn what a role model is supposed to be. Because it's easy for you to be a good one or a bad one. It is. And my choice definitely was to be on top for myself and for my kids and for people who cared about me. So, Paul, your your trip to Sarajevo lasted. How many weeks were you there? And, and in, uh, in where? In Sarajevo. I think Carol and I were there probably about uh, a little over a month, month maybe two months. Mm-hmm. Uh, we enjoyed being there. Uh, uh, I enjoyed going to school and talking to the kids and explaining why I paint what I paint mm-hmm. and how they can make a better world. 
and how they can make sure that what, what their elders did that they won't do. Mm-hmm. I said, learn to accept people for who they are as long as it doesn't hurt you, mm. as long as you both can move ahead at the same time. Mm. So your it, artwork put you in a unique platform it, it, to be it able did. to communicate that. My artwork was talking. I, I, I didn't realize how powerful my art. That's one of the things. I realized that I was on the right track, but I wasn't really sure because some of the museums were turning their backs on me. Mm-hmm. But when I went there and saw what was doing and how that would affect those people, mm. everything in me said, man, you are on the right mm-hmm. track. Mm-hmm. In fact, you might be able to go to some of the museums and tell them now you're on the wrong track. Yeah. You know? So your dreams have been more than fulfilled. Yes. Really, I I have never, I, I just never thought that my art was really that powerful. And I it mean, is. imagine with all the artists on the face of the earth, they chose me. And what does that say to me? It says that you were you had something special. That's you, right. That what I was doing was was getting the people's soul. Yes. And my artwork, and see, one of the problems too with a lot of artwork. It's there to please a few people hmm. because it says a few things that they want to hear, especially some of the people who decide us what is and what isn't art. New York has the ability to do that. They couldn't do that with my work. I was listening to the people. That's where I was going. And right now, uh, this is not to turn subjects. It's part of the subject we really have to think about. Mm-hmm. Right now, Countries are saying, well, you know, you better think twice about going to America because they're into this gun thing. You got to probably get shot. Mm -hmm. And I I, got to ask you a question. Mm -hmm. What is there about guns that has been such a derivative for men that will actually pay thousands of dollars to go to Africa just to shoot an animal? Mm -hmm. I, I I don't get that. And I don't get why we don't have, I'm not saying get rid of it, but why are we allowing weapons that only soldiers have being sold? Yeah, I know. I think a lot of it has to do with the rights, you know, wanting to make sure that you can bear arms. I think that, uh, unfortunately, the America that we live in, the, the rights issue for, for men is an important issue. That's one of the issues, I think. But that it should never get in the, in the way, Paul, of... A human life. If if we are if we have gotten so fond of guns to the point that anybody can buy them, and that we we got we have these like you say, army uh, weapons out on the streets, then it's it's time to rethink that. It, it really we, is, it really is. And and what is the message you're sending other countries? You know, when we tell other countries be like us, how are you going to tell them to be like us when you? are in love with guns and little kids now have to hide under their school mm. school tables. I, I don't I don't get that at all. And I'm not saying and, and I'm not saying you shouldn't have one. I'm just saying why are you giving out the type of guns that you're selling now? And why would you go in uh, all the way to Africa and spend thousands of dollars just to shoot an animal? You know, that would be a great conversation to have. We should we should bring someone on the show and talk about that at some yeah. point and and just have that discussion because it's 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 a hot topic. It is. It's, it's a, a hot very topic. hot topic. But you know what I want to do is is have people like you on the show, Paul, who think the way that you think. You talk about the love that you have for humanity, and wanting to make the world a better place. I mean, you truly care about people, and the other that's the other, what we need to get the message. Yeah, out and for. the other that thing negative is, message we don't need to hear from. And the other thing is, we're supposed to be an example for the rest of the world. Absolutely, we have something really unique in this country called a democracy. We have something very unique in this country where women can aspire to go wherever they want to go. Now, when you look around now, you see the women doing things that they weren't. It used to be a woman couldn't even drive a car. I know. I know, Paul. What a what a what a what a sad world we lived in at one point. So, Paul, what would you want your family, your children, your community, to say about you? 
you know, we're all getting up there in age and, 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 and at some point we're going to leave this world. What would you want them to say and to know and remember you by? What would, what would that be? That I've never been a hypocrite and I've always allowed them to be honest with me. Mm-hmm. And that's really, really important, uh, especially with your kids. Because when they're growing up now, or they're married now, and you're making, they're making decisions, and they ask you, mm-hmm. and I always say to them, I want you to do the same thing that I've always allowed you to do. Right. Let me be honest with you. That is really important because you're doing something that's really stupid. And I'm not going to lie to you just because you're my daughter. I'm going to tell you the truth. And I've allowed you to do that with me as your father. That's powerful. And I'll tell you who told me something like that once, Coretta King. I'm on her board, and uh, this one guy was saying, oh, you know what? Paul Collins is such a celebrity. He's got all these friends. And Coretta said, don't you believe that? Hmm. Don't you believe that for a minute, Paul? He said, she said, your friends are the ones that will tell you when you're doing something wrong. The people who are just in love with you because of your, your fame. Your money. And money will tell you whatever you want to hear. Those aren't your friends. And she's right. And that's what I tell my kids, too. Just like I, you know, I have a daughter now. Her and her husband aren't doing well. And I told her, I said, uh. She asked, wanted me to give her some advice. I said, well, you know it's going to be truth. That's good. Well, I must be one of your friends. Well, you've always been. You tell me the truth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, it's been a wonderful time with you, and I love it that we had you share with us what you really think and what you really believe in. And uh, I well, just... Well, let me tell you something. Yes. I think you're a wonderful role model, and I admire you. Well, thank you. For being the person you are and the things you stand for. And we need more people like you who are in the position where people can hear you. Now, I didn't pay him to say that. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Paul. And we're, we're going to wrap it up. And thank you all for joining Fulfilling the Dream again today. We look forward to seeing you next time on Fulfilling the Dream. Thanks for listening to Fulfilling the Dream with Wayman Britt, the podcast that gives you courage and confidence to fulfill your dreams. Discover the riveting personal account of Wayman's journey in his book, Fulfilling the Dream, My Path to Leadership and Finding Purpose Through Serving Others. Available in print and audiobook. If you haven't done it yet, subscribe to Fulfilling the Dream, wherever you get your podcast. Share this episode with others. If you think you don't know them well enough, do it anyway. Be bold. Make a connection. And if you have a powerful story to tell, let us hear it. To get connected, visit fulfillingthedreampodcast.com. <laughs>